Hello, my name is Dr. Pete Villarreal III, and I am your host today for The Perspicacious Professor. Today, we tackle the issue of estimating causal effects. So we turn our attention to a specific chapter in a book called Estimating Causal Effects Using Observational Data. The chapter was written by Schneider et al. For a very long time, we've devoted our efforts to as researchers, focusing in on data analysis. And in particular, we're interested in sort of data analysis to get at causal effects. Unfortunately, the research required, the designs required to estimate causal effects typically are the randomized controlled trial or the randomized uh, controlled experiments. Those types of designs are and can be quite costly. They can require a lot of time, conditions under which the experiments are conducted can be uh, unnatural. Uh, that is, they don't really mimic what is happening in society or what, what is happening in the real world. So we've uh, created data sources and data sets, and with those data sets, we've created significant advances in both theory and methods, or methodologically speaking, we've advanced ourselves in the field of education to develop techniques that allow us to estimate causal effects using these types of secondary data sources. So some of the more common uh, sort of data sources are, uh, are of this nature. They're called large-scale data sets. They're often referred to by some as observational studies, and in other uh, contexts they're referred to as non-experimental research. Unfortunately, that's a misnomer um, because not all non-experimental data falls under the umbrella of observational data. Uh, there is a different and a uniqueness between this. But some of the observational data out there that, uh, that has been really popular more recently and that a significant body of research has been conducted upon uh, are the data sources that are uh, produced by the federal government, in particular the U.S. Department of Education, and a unit within that called uh, National Center for Educational uh, Statistics, NCES. They've uh, developed large-scale data projects from ECHLs to NELS to ELS to high school and beyond to data sources in higher education such as the beginning post-secondary study, the baccalaureate and beyond, NAPSAS, which is technically a more uh, financial aid data set, uh, in addition, we have IPEDS, which is the Integrated Post-Secondary Education Study. It is designed um, specifically to collect data or to collect data on institutions in order to participate in federal programs such as financial aid or uh, federal grants, research grants, or other types of grants. Institutions of higher education are required by law to participate or to submit data on their institutions. And that's how the federal government collects this data on a regular basis and maintains the da data in, uh, uh, in the federal government's purview called iPads. So in fact, this type of data source is unique from all the rest of the data sources in that it tends to be more of a population or universe type data. It isn't necessarily a probability sample like most of the other, uh, most of the other data sets that I've mentioned. Uh, they, it tends to include almost every single institution of higher education in the country, and that makes it very, very useful in terms of doing uh, a lot of analyses and a lot of different types of analyses. Now, these types of large-scale data sets are drawn typically from multi-stage probability samples, which do allow for us to conduct the types of analyses that we have been trying to advance over time, that type of predictive analyses, or the ability to make predictions about future occurrences based on current data. We can make also some tentative causal inference, but largely based on the fact that it is based on longitudinal data. Uh, NELS, ELS, High School and Beyond, BPS, ECHLs, B and B tends to be uh, on long-term type uh, data sets. That is, 
they follow individuals over or subjects over an extended period of time, sometimes up to 12 years of data is collected on individual subjects. That type of data set allows us to make at least temporal, uh, get at temporal effects, if not true causal effects. But those inferences have to be tempered by the fact that not always can you make those types of causal statements and that a traditional sort of regression equation doesn't necessarily get you the types of estimates or the ability to make that causal claim in that if you're going to make causal claims you typically have to resort to a randomized controlled trial or a randomized controlled experiment. Those methods, uh, those designs are structured in a way that allow you to get at causal effects or allow you to make causal claims. The data sources here aren't necessarily designed to make those causal claims in and of themselves. That is, you have to use some sophisticated techniques, statistical analytic techniques, that allow you to jump the hoop and start making some of these causal claims. Uh, so part of what you do is use the data wisely in, in a way to justify not just whether a correlation or an association exists, but rather you do the analyses in a way that allows you to make that causal claim. Statisticians and econometricians are two classes of uh, researchers that have spent a significant amount of time developing some of these techniques to, that uh, are used on these types of data, these types of observational data. Now keep in mind that those data sources are not the only data sources in which you can actually use to, to conduct these types of analyses. States have now created a significant amount of their own and maintain their own data sources. Uh, many states today, like the state of Florida and the state of Texas and other states, now follow individuals all the way from pre-K all the way through public higher education within their states. That type of data is an amazing set of data that you can actually conduct, observational data that you can conduct, a, a series of analyses with unbelievable uh, ability and facility to actually make some of these causal claims. That is what's so exciting about this new era of data, especially as we begin to think about large-scale data, and in some circles it's referred to as big data as well. These data sets really can begin to, and when you conduct analyses with these types of data sets, they can really inform not only practice and policy, as uh, we've kind of been arguing over time, but it also can inform the future design of specific randomized controlled trials or randomized controlled experiments. That's the benefit of using this type of technique, and that's sort of the power that these types of statistical or these types of data sources have in that they're sizable data sources, they're based on probability samples, which allow you to get at uh, estimates of inference or allows you to make inferences to broader populations. And then they do control for selection effects in, in specific ways. The ability to actually inform based on a series of of techniques or whatnot inform the potential possible interventions or possible programs or possible policy suggestions and especially given that these data sets tend to be quite sizable you can even do subpopulations you can begin to test out whether the interventions can be specifically designed for one subpopulation or one sub a group over other types of groups, and you can begin to ascertain the effects or the effectiveness of specific interventions on certain populations and not others. The power of this type of data analysis is just that, whereas randomized controlled trials, you would basically have to conduct a different or a completely different study or a completely different randomized controlled experiment or randomized controlled trial with each different subpopulation if you would want to make that type of uh, suggestion. The power of this, of course, is that data has already been pre-collected by other researchers 
and it's being given to you as uh, as a statistician or as a researcher to actually use your own analysis. Now, the fact is you have to be an astute researcher and an astute data analyst to be able to apply the types of analyses that you're trying to get at. If you're trying to get a causal claims or whatnot, you have to be sophisticated enough to know how to use these. But granted, the level of sophistication among researchers in the education field has increased quite dramatically over the past few, uh, uh, even the last decade, the, the, the quality of educational research being produced uh, has increased quite significantly. We know that there are issues associated with trade-offs in using one type of, of analysis over a different one. We, we understand that the randomized controlled experiment or the randomized controlled trial has specific strengths, but it also has weaknesses. And the same thing with using these large scale data sets. One of them being, of course, that you have to know how to use the data sets correctly. You need to be able to have the sophistication to be able to apply the, uh, the, the knowledge or apply the techniques well. Going back to the randomized controlled experiment and randomized controlled trials, some of the drawbacks of this type of approach or the, that type of design is that it can be very difficult to run an experiment. And oftentimes it's actually unethical to run the types of experiments that we would like to run. So we're left with devising techniques and use, using other types of, of methods or designs to estimate the, the assumed causal uh, relationships between variables or between a treatment and an outcome uh, by ensuring that the data or, or by ensuring that the analytic technique is well done. So one of the big issues of course with these large-scale data sets is the idea of sample selection bias, the idea that the sample is not representative of the overall population. Now the good thing is that these data sets are designed and have been collected using probability sampling techniques They've often been re-weighted afterwards or weights have been created to ensure that the sample is representative of the overall population. Knowing and understanding how to use those weights, knowing and understanding how to employ some of those statistical techniques in an accurate and appropriate way allows us to get away from the sample bias that exists in the data. But we also have to be cognizant of the idea of selection bias. Uh, that can be introduced in the sample. That is, people, especially with these large-scale data sets, people have already decided to either participate in a treatment condition or in a control condition. That is, the researcher has absolutely no control over deciding who gets the treatment and who doesn't. Whereas with the RCT design or the experimental design, the researcher completely has control over who gets the experiment and who doesn't. That is the condition under which the researcher can actually employ and come to the causal effect. That the only difference between the two groups is the fact that one received the treatment and one didn't, but even the assignment of the treatment condition was randomly conducted. That is, there was random assignment. Under the conditions of these large-scale data sets, Typically, assignment is never random. That is, the individuals that selected to participate in the treatment condition have, for whatever reason, self-selected into that group. And the people who decided not to participate in the treatment have self-selected out of participation. That is a problem. But there, there is a way to deal with that self-selection bias. And as long as we understand the process by which individuals have selected into the treatment condition or the control condition, we can actually, and we observe those in the data, we can actually control for those effects and thus create, by design, create comparable treatment and control groups, almost as if it were an experimental condition. That's an exciting advance in educational research and I think that's sort of where much of the advances in research are going to as well. The other issue that is often a significant issue is the omitted variable bias. Omitted variables are 
often a huge problem when we're employing regression techniques. And regression is, of course, a technique that allows us to control for all possible sources of bias, all possible sources of, of characteristics that may have an effect on the outcome or the Y variable. When you're actually doing this type of an analysis, if the outcome, the Y variable, is, a, is related to the error term, then you've actually created a condition that the error is associated to the Y, thus you've omitted a variable. That assumption or that violation of the assumption of independence, IID, for the error term creates this omitted variable bias. And it typically either inflates or deflates the actual true effect on the outcome based on the rest of the, uh, of the variables. So the predictions become inaccurate at that point. So as a researcher, we have, or as researchers, we have a set or a suite of tools available to us that allow us to make the causal claim based on the fact that you can handle this problem of omitted variable bias. And we'll talk in greater detail as to how we handle both selection on observables and omitted variables. The methods or the techniques or the statistical means by which we use to approximate, approximate randomized assignment are these four techniques. There are more than these four general types. There are actually a few more within or subsumed within some of these actually quite frankly but I'm going to give you sort of the nuts and bolts of what the authors say are the more important pieces to understand the fixed effects model the instrumental variables regression approach the propensity scores approach and the regression discontinuity approach all of these are designed to allow us to get at the true causal effect by creating a, a situation where random assignment becomes the condition of treatment and control. And you do that uh, in spite of the fact that treatment assignment was not under the, the researcher's control. Again, the omitted variable bias is sort of the first issue that we're going to ta tackle. Omitted variable bias, of course, is the effect of eliminating a variable or not having observed the specific variable that is related to the outcome that should have been included in the equation or in the model but because you either didn't observe it or because the researchers that were collecting the data failed to collect that specific variable, you are left to fix or to account for that omitted variable bias in a number of ways. Now, there are definitely different techniques that you can apply to help you deal with this issue. One of the more common ways that people deal with this issue is through something called fixed effects regression analysis or fixed effects regression. This approach is available to statisticians under certain conditions. When you have large scale data sets in which the data has been collected over extended periods of time, and that is the individuals have been uh, studied or investigated or observed multiple times, and oftentimes they've been measured on the same characteristics or variables over time uh, to see if differences have, have occurred over time. And what the researchers really trying to get at in this type of condition is, okay, if variable X, which is your treatment, variable XT is your treatment, and you have a series of other variables that affect Y, your outcome of interest, that XT is what you're trying to get at. What is the effect of XT on the outcome, controlling for any potential sources, of bias or any potential sources of effects 
that the other control variables, the other x's have been, that have been included into the model could have. A major concern in data analysis is that unobserved characteristics are correlated with both the treatment and the outcome variables. And that becomes somewhat of a troublesome issue again. So what ends up happening is that controlling for such unobserved characteristics would reduce bias in the estimate of the treatment effect. But if you fail to control for that unobserved characteristic, then you have biased your estimates. One way that you can control for those unobserved characteristics is to look for a characteristic that is highly associated, but that could be included as a proxy for the omitted variable. And if you can find a good proxy for that omitted variable, then that's fantastic. You've actually closed, at least as best as you can, you've actually closed that loophole. Unfortunately, even in light of the fact that you may have good proxies or you may have failed to include good proxies, there's still that problem that you could have failed to have observed a good proxy or a good variable that you should have controlled for. When you have that problem, fixed effects models are specifically designed to control for that. If the effect is fixed, what does fixed mean? Well, if the effect is fixed means that the characteristic that, you, that could potentially have an effect but that was omitted does not change over time. Characteristics like these are typically characteristics such as one's ethnicity or one's race. That doesn't change over time. That's a fixed effect. That's something about an individual that will not change over time. Somebody's gender or somebody's sex doesn't change over time. That's a fixed effect. It stays constant. That type of, of characteristic, if what it was omitted, can be accounted for using a fixed effects model. This model, this method, can account for that. Now you might ask, well, what, what if I left out a variable or omitted a variable that changes over time? Some sort of variable that might change over time, such as one's income might change over time. This year it might be minimum wage. The next year it might be double that. The following year it may be higher than that. Because that variable of that individual changes over time, could change over time, and likely will change, especially if you have long data, long-term data sources, as this type of study typically does. That's problematic for the data, and for the and this model does not handle effects that change. Unfortunately, the best thing in those conditions is to actually include those variables in the model or in the equation. And if you don't have it, then you have to use a different technique. Again, the, the assumption is that the unobserved characteristic is fixed, and if it is not fixed, that assumption may not necessarily hold. So if that doesn't hold, if for whatever reason the characteristic that was omitted is not a fixed characteristic, then you cannot use this approach. You have to use another approach that allows you to estimate the effect under the assumptions that the, that the omitted variable was not such. These models do considerably reduce the sample size, making it difficult to detect treatment effects. Fixed effects estimates tend to be biased in the direction of no effect. That is, the, these models tend to come out to null effects or that there was no statistically significant uh, relationship. And the reason behind it is that what ends up happening in this, in this model is that each individual subject, if you have a data set with 900 subjects, each individual subject becomes a variable that identifies that individual. So you have 899 variables. If you have 900 uh, subjects in your data set, you have 899 variables that are going to be, in essence, included in the equation. You basically create a dummy variable, zero, if anybody else, one for subject one, and so on down the line. And because of the sample size and the reduction of the sample size, that sample may not necessarily be representative of the overall population. So it becomes difficult to actually ascertain whether the effect 
is a true effect of your population or if it's a subsample of it. Again, this technique is still a very useful technique. It's an older technique, but it's still useful if you have omitted a variable that you should have collected but weren't able to collect for whatever reason. This is also a technique that was implemented or could be useful for researchers who are designing studies and want to collect data, but they don't want to spend that much time collecting data on individual subjects. They rather collect data that changes over time within those individual subjects. So they may not be interested in gender effects, race effects, you know, things such as demographics that don't necessarily change over time. And they can use the space to collect data on other things and other things that might change over time and making the data collection a little bit more uh, useful for the researcher. But other than that, it's really a tool designed to allow us to make causal estimates in the face of certain conditions. And if you meet those conditions, you're able to apply this technique. Another technique that is available is called instrumental variables. This is perhaps the most used example of an instrumental variables example. Most books will use this as the example because it was sort of one of the first studies that was sort of utilized in, the, in this case scenario. And there are three basic assumptions that underlie the use of this method. Researchers are really interested in understanding whether educational level, in this case it's called exposure, whether educational attainment, the, the level of educational attainment one has, is causally related or causally associated to the earnings you will have later on in life. So is education associated with your earnings? Most people would say, yes, it is. And most people would agree that the higher your level of education, the higher your earnings potential will be. Now, we also know that there are other characteristics that are associated with earnings. It is possible that other aspects about an individual could affect their earnings. If somebody lives in a certain area, such as living in a in an urban setting versus a rural setting that could really affect one's earnings potential. It doesn't have to, but it could. That said, you would control for those other characteristics in spite of the fact that you have exposure of education or education being the predictor of choice or the variable that you want to run and test to see if it does indeed affect earnings potential. And you would keep the others as control variables in the model or the equation. But let us assume for a second that there was some sort of unmeasured confounder in your model. Maybe you forgot as a researcher to include a variable or a measure of one's ability. We know that ability has an effect on one's educational attainment. The higher able you are, the higher capable you are, the higher your level of attainment will be. We also know that ability is also predictive of one's earning. The more able you are, the higher your earnings potential is going to be. And you just realize after the fact that you forgot to measure this confounding factor. What do you do? Well, in this condition or in this situation, you can use instrumental variables to help tease out the actual effect of education on earnings, net of anything else. The instrumental variable allows us to instrument out the effect of other characteristics on, the, uh, on earnings net of the education uh, effect on earnings. What does this mean? Well, the instrumental variable is used so long as the instrument itself is related to the level of educational attainment or the level of one's education, but is completely unrelated to the outcome of interest, in this case, the earnings potential. And that's the exclusionary assumption. The first assumption is that the instrument is related to education. 
That's the relevance assumption. And the exclusionary restriction is that the instrument itself is completely unrelated to the outcome. And in addition to that, the variable, the, 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 the confounder that you omitted, the omitted variable, is unrelated to the instrument itself. If you find a good instrument that is related to education, and we know that one's proximity to college, that is how far you are to a college, could very well affect the level of educational attainment you will achieve. But we also know that your proximity to college has nothing to do with your earnings potential. And we also know that your proximity to college has nothing to do with your abilities. So given that those three assumptions have been met, then you can estimate what is called a two-stage least squares estimator. The first estimate will estimate the instrument on the outcome or on the exposure variable, in this case, the educational attainment. And then the second estimate will include prediction scores from that first equation as a control variable in essence in the second equation of education on earnings controlling for all other characteristics that could, poten could potentially affect earnings outcome as well. But you forgot ability. Well, it doesn't matter anymore that you forgot ability because now you have the instrument that allows you to approximate what would have been the effect of ability and to estimate that out of the equation. And then you get a true net effect of education on earnings based on the instrumental variable. This technique corrects for omitted variables. It's called IV regression instrumental variable regression. It was developed nearly 40 years ago. It was largely developed by economists to get around a different problem or a different issue called supply and demand curves. Now, even though it was trying to solve a different problem, it has been extended in research to help us correct for omitted variable bias when estimating causal relationships. If the omitted variable could be measured and held constant over time, the problem of omitting that variable can be avoided by using the fixed effects regression technique that we described previously. But if that condition is not met, IV is designed to correct for this problem, this omitted variable problem. It allows us to use an instrument, a variable that precedes the treatment variable that is predictive of the treatment in essence, but is completely unassociated with the outcome of the study. And it also, of course, that the, that instrument cannot be associated with the omitted variable in the model. The typical approach is to use a two-stage least squares estimator, which is often referred to as 2SLS. And the instrument and in covariance that are used to predict the, the endogenous variables is uh, the endogenous variable in this case being education. And then in the second stage, the dependent variable is regressing the fitted values of the first stage equation and any of the covariates that are assumed to affect the outcome, in this case, earnings potential. The bias in the estimation of the earnings potential of an individual resulting from the exclusion of ability from the model is thus removed once you have done this two-stage modeling. Now, one of the biggest issues about this type of technique is that it's almost impossible to find good instruments or good instrumental variables. In most cases, IVs are fairly weak, uh, but even in the condition that they're pretty strong, the assumptions of the instrument being completely unrelated to the outcome of interest for the study or to be unrelated, completely unrelated to the omitted variable itself, can be quite difficult to me, that, that, that assessment. And that's a very difficult argument to make. Now you make that argument on theoretical grounds, but there are also statistical tests that can be run in order to allow you to feel your arm most uh, are, are on stronger grounds to make the, the statement that the instrumental variable is, is a weak variable or is a strong instrument to include in the analysis. 
Either way, instrumental variables regression is a technique that allows us to get at that effect, to get at that causal estimate under the conditions that we uh, have omitted a variable that's quite important, that is endogenous, of course, to the outcome of interest. The third set of techniques out there is something called propensity scores. Propensity scores is or was developed unlike the first two sets of analytic tools or analytic approaches which were developed by economists. This set of tools were developed by statisticians largely. Now econometricians have developed their own uh, propensity score analytic techniques that coincide with uh, the statisticians versions and diverge as well from the, uh, from the statistical versions as well. But either way, the idea behind propensity scores is that you have a control and a treatment group, and what you're trying to do is trying to find matches between the control group and the treatment group. And if you can find people in the control group that are similar in every single way to the treatment group or the control group and vice versa, then you will find matches from which you can actually conduct the study. And anybody that does not match gets eliminated from the sample or eliminated from the analysis, fundamentally from the analysis. And in that condition, you will have to make sure that you talk about your inference set, your, your population of inference differently than the overall population of your data source, because you will have reduced Typically, you reduce your sample size significantly when you use these propensity scores. But the propensity scores allow you to create, in a quasi-experimental way, a treatment and a control group that are identical in all facets or characteristics that you think are important in the, self, in, in the selection process. And again, propensity scores begins to get at the selection effects bias associated with an individual selecting into a treatment group and or into the control group. So this technique is a rather unique technique in that it turns randomization on its head. In the traditional experimental approach, we allow randomization to eliminate all potential sources of bias, the process by which Sir Ronald Fisher, the, one of the early agricultural statisticians uh, of the time, called for the idea of randomization. And if you use randomization both in the selection of individuals into the study, but also randomization in the assignment to treatment and control conditions, that that ability to use randomization in each of those steps would eliminate all potential sources of bias and you would not need to control for any other characteristics because they would be equivalently distributed across both the treatment and control conditions. In a large-scale data source of this nature, you don't have control over both, well, you have control over the sampling and the selection of subjects into your sample. What you don't have control over typically is treatment assignment. And so what we tend to do is we use the statistical technique of randomization or we use regression techniques to help estimate the process by which people self-select into the treatment and control conditions and we estimate one equation to help us define what is the probability of the individual being in the treatment and control group or the treatment condition and then we use those prediction scores or those scores in a way to fashion out propensity scores that allow us to match individuals between the treatment and control group on a scale, and it allows us to partition out all potential sources of bias at that point. And if somebody doesn't match on these scores, they get eliminated from the sample. So I didn't mean to say all sources of bias, but all sources of bias that can be attributed to observed uh, the observed variables or the observed characteristics that are included in the data set itself. Propensity scores are actually a means of actually eliminating potential bias for which you actually have observed those characteristics. That is, that you have collected data on those potential sources 
or those potential variables that affect the selection uh, into treatment assignment. And that is propensity scores is used to correct for selection bias in essence. It's, a, it's the easy way of saying it. Unlike IB regression, uh, propensity scores can only handle selection bias with observable characteristics, whereas IV can handle both selection bias and the omitted variable bias. That's the strength with IV regression, of course, handling, as I've, I've kind of mentioned earlier, I, uh, instrumental variables regression can be a little tricky to handle, and you must have the right instrument, and meeting those assumptions can be uh, quite onerous for the researcher, if not for the data. But propensity score methods are essentially a version of regression or matching that allows researchers to focus on the observed covariates that matter most. And there are various types of uh, propensity score analytic techniques, methods that allow you to use greedy matching to optimal matching to simple uh, regression estimate uh, afterwards to doubly robust estimators to there are a variety of propensity score techniques that are currently being used in the field and the verdict is still out as to whether as to whether one type of method is preferred over other types of methods uh, with respect to propensity score uh, techniques but suffice it to say it is a it is a new evolving area uh, you have many people trying to enter this realm to help justify uh, the use of these larger scale data sets in the, and try to draw out causal claims based on correcting for potential sources of bias. And what you do in, in the case scenario is match subjects in both treatment and control groups using uh, various characteristics or variables that you think affect the individual's decision to self-select into treatment condition or self-select into the control condition. If you have those characteristics, you know what those characteristics are, the characteristics that can be attributed to the selection process, you can actually uh, control for those characteristics, take out, in essence, tease out those effects by estimating a first stage model, in essence, uh, where the selection effects are modeled against those characteristics that you have or that you think are associated with that selection process. Once you've done that, you estimate prediction scores, and those prediction scores are used in a formula that allows you to create propensity scores, and those propensity scores are used to match subjects in both the treatment group and the control group. Now, a limitation of the PS method is that they adjust only for observed differences. It is possible that a relevant variable may have been omitted that pertains to the selection process. And if you omitted that variable, you still have that omitted variable bias. Another, pro another uh, benefit to this technique, however, is that you actually can do what is called doubly robust technique. A doubly robust uh, propensity score analytic technique allows you to estimate the propensity score ahead of, as we uh, as I kind of described right now, but then use those estimators in a later equation where you estimate the, the treatment variable that you're trying to estimate and its effect on the outcome while controlling for potential sources of bias or, or potential sources of other characteristics that are affecting the outcome of interest for you. So as long as one of those two equations is correct, and you could have one be biased, you could have one equation be incorrect, you could have misspecified one of the, bear, one of the equations, either the first step equation or the second step equation. But so long as one of them is correctly specified, your estimators of the actual treatment effect will be accurate. And again, there are techniques out there within the propensity score anal analysis suite of techniques to help test for sensitivities for possible omitted uh, variables. If you believe or think that there may be an omitted variable bias, uh, or there may be some sort of omitted variable that may be affecting some sort of process or some sort of outcome of interest for you, you can actually use some techniques that are available that have been created by statisticians to help elucidate whether you do indeed uh, 
have an omitted variables issue, uh, bias or issue in, in your uh, equations. Next, we turn our attention to the fourth technique, which is called regression discontinuity. Regression discontinuity is a technique that has been created largely, uh, has evolved from experimental psychologists and uh, statisticians who have been concerned about being able to tease out a treatment effect within a very small uh, segment of the population. And let us assume that we have a range of scores or range of values on some sort of measure, some sort of instrument, from 0 to 100. And it's for all practical purposes, fairly normally distributed and fairly normally over the scale, you find cases falling throughout the scale. However, there is some sort of defined cut score, which means that the defined cut score suggests and or implies that people who fall within this number and above will receive some sort of benefit typically some sort of treatment condition, or what is typically the, the, the standard sort of example, which is the scholarship program. So if you fall above a score, you get the scholarship. If you fall slightly below or below the score, you do not and are not offered a scholarship program. That cut score is a very valuable score in terms of who gets offered a treatment and who does not get offered, that's a treatment. If the, if the variable is normally distributed, if the variable is scaled correctly, if there are no interventions or uh, if there are no meaningful interventions occurring, no meaningful uh, effects happening within society, uh, teachers aren't trying to help students get over that score, that 50 uh, score there's no other interventions occurring, then you are likely going to have a normal line uh, across. In the event that you do have that, then you can apply this regression discontinuity test, this regression discontinuity analytic tool. In the event that you do, and you see that your outcome of interest in that case is whether they are successful later on, you can begin to test out within subjects who are slightly above and slightly below a specific score, in this case that score, that 50 score, and there's sufficient enough people above and sufficient enough people below that score, then you can actually use this method to be able to tease out whether there is some sort of treatment effect occurring. What this means is that you can actually draw up what are two separate regression equation lines, those for people that fall below and those for people that fall slightly above, the cut score to help discern whether there is a gap in the actual intercept or in the actual line, I should say, in, in, in the equation. And if there is both an effect and intercept and an, an effect, typically an effect and intercept but also an effect in, in the slope itself and it's steeper for one side or the other then you know that there's some sort of effect occurring especially with respect to that cut score the problem with this is that you can only say that the, there is a true effect with respect to the treatment condition of being awarded the scholarship or not. If and only if you have a certain number of subjects that fall below and above and there's significant bands or those bands are wide enough to help you, or, uh, help you include enough cases slightly above and slightly below to allow you to make that claim. But if that's the case, you don't need any other variable in the model. You do not need any other characteristics. You do not need to control for any other effects. You do not need, because it is so local, it is so specific to cases that fall right below and right above that cut score. Uh, subjects that fall right above and right below should not differ much on, on any set of characteristics 
that the individuals in that grouping have. And that's the power of this is that it really turns data that is a large scale data set into a more laboratory specified experiment, but within a natural setting. This fourth method plays on features of certain occurrences in education that have the qualities of what is a natural experiment again. It examines subjects or individuals who fall slightly under and slightly above a certain cut score to examine differences in the effect of some sort of policy or program or intervention. Now, we, if we assume that the individuals in the restricted group, in this smaller group of people that fall slightly above and slightly below, approximate a random assignment to the treatment and control groups, the estimated regression uh, uh, models at the cut point yields an unbiased estimate of the treatment effect. Now, one of the benefits is if you have multiple discontinuities on that same line. So if you offer a scholarship for individuals uh, if they score 25 and then offer a different scholarship if they score a 50 and then offer a different scholarship if they score 75 and so on, if you have multiple cut scores, you can actually create multiple tests and that increases the validity of your results should you be getting the same results across the entire line of scores. Analyses based on these large-scale data, data sets have a greater likelihood of detecting treatment effects and that's what makes these these techniques a little bit more beneficial but regression discontinuity assumes that students in the two groups have similar characteristics and that assumption needs to be checked. So if you have people slightly above and slightly below that cut score, then you have to still check and see the subjects that are slightly above that cut score and slightly below. Do they have the same characteristics? Are they from the same neighborhoods? Do they have the same SES? Do they have the same SAT, ACT scores? Do they typically have the same? Or is that cut score really meaningfully different? For people that fall slightly above as opposed to people that fall slightly below. The people that fall slightly above are from higher SES groups, whereas people that fall below that cut score typically come from lower SES groups. If you begin to see patterns emerging where the discontinuity can be attributed to other characteristics, not to the Z cut score, not to the treatment effect, then that really begins to change the assumption uh, uh, that really begins to get at uh, at affecting the typical uh, the, the typical assumptions for the utility of the regression discontinuity and analytic technique again the the big thing about regression discontinuity is having some sort of value variable that is continuous in nature and that is continuous uh, correlated with another variable but for which there is a value on that continuous scale that is meaningful that is important because there's been some sort of policy intervention some sort of practical intervention some sort of program that has been implemented for people that fall slightly above that value if that happens then you have the conditions set for the application of regression discontinuity it makes a very, very capable type technique for you to actually estimate the, the treatment effect under these types of conditions. These are, in essence, your four types of tools available to you as a statistician, as a researcher, who's dealing with these larger scale data sets that could be very effective means at getting at different types of treatment effects. So what does all of this mean? <clears throat> well, the methods being used by social scientists in analyzing large uh, data sets address key issues in education policy and practice as well. The studies that were reviewed here have carefully analyzed the sources of bias and the, a series of estimation problems in the data set. They address issues that have come have been common in they address issues that are common in the use of these types of data.
The methods illustrate, indeed, how large data sets can be used to obtain unbiased estimates of treatment effects. Here, we were able to provide examples of how four different approaches can help us yield results that we uh, that are more robust than just typical standard regression equations or typical estimates of correlations or whatnot. It's also important to note that there are limits to survey analysis, even when adjusting for selection bias and multiple levels of analysis. And those limits need to be uh, understood and adhered to. You cannot apply some technique that just doesn't make sense uh, to apply, especially when you have not met the assumptions of using those, the specific techniques. Regardless, some of the results have implications for causal inference. Whatever the case may be, whatever results you uh, uh, attain from your analyses with these large-scale data sets, you, you're going to be able to make some sort of causal claim if you do it correctly, if you apply the analysis correctly, and if you follow the typical assumptions. I think the benefit of these types of techniques and the continued advance of the uh, statistical and econometric literature is that it, they're really helping us create a more robust world in terms of the types of analytic te tools available to us to help estimate appropriate uh, effects or causal effects or make uh, uh, or estimate appropriate uh, statistics that help us make causal claims.